Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we are about to have. God, I just pray that uh, as Pastor Deepika teaches uh, all my classmates and myself, God, I pray that you'll help us to open our mind and heart and listen and understand the deep truths that are in the Bible, Jesus. I pray for all my classmates uh, who are about to join. God, I just pray that uh, you will give us all good Wi-Fi connections and uh, you'll help us to understand. Holy Spirit, you'll be our teacher, you'll be our guide and uh, help us to learn new learn something new from the class today and to live life for your glory, Jesus. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. didn't realize it was not on. Yeah, good morning. Uh, we'll begin today with uh, John chapter 6. Uh, we'll cover chapter 6 and 7 today. That's the plan. Uh, they are rather lengthy, uh, so there's a lot of information in these chapters, uh, but we'll try to cover as much as possible. Uh, so we'll begin. Um, if we can have uh, one of us read out verses 1 to 4 of chapter 6, uh, we'll get started. So if we can have someone read out uh, John chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. John chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is in the, which is in the Sea of Tiberia. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were deceived. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now, the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude. We'll uh, look at these verses later. Um, lot of static on the line. Okay, yeah. Um, we had uh, Brother Collins read out for us verses 1 to 4. Uh, we see that Jesus is um, on the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. And there's a large crowd that comes to the mountainside uh, to, you know, to see him, to listen to him. And just so that we have a clearer background regarding this, uh, maybe we would need to go to Luke chapter 9, verses 10 to 11, where we get a little more background regarding why they are over here on this mountainside, on the far shore of Galilee right now. Uh, so um, if we can also have someone read out for us, Luke chapter 9, verses 10 to 11, just to get a little more uh, background information regarding the setting of this uh, particular passage. Luke 9, 10 to 11, please. And the and the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately in a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethesda. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who need those who had need of healing. Yeah. So we see that this event takes place immediately after the mission trip on which Jesus sent the disciples. 
So he tells them to go into uh, the different towns and villages and tell people to repent because the kingdom of God is near. He gives them the authority to perform signs and wonders. Uh, and so uh, the disciples have now come back very excited. Uh, you know, in fact, they say in Luke um, that even the demons are responding uh, to us. And uh, so they are very happy with the good progress that they could make during the mission trip. And obviously, they must be rather tired now because they would have traveled on foot from place to place, uh, would have had many sleepless nights. And so now Jesus says, you know, let's all go away and uh, just spend some time by ourselves where we can rest and, you know, just uh, reflect upon all that took place. So this was supposed to be a, a, a private time for Jesus and his disciples. So he takes them away to the mountainside uh, where they can all just spend some time together and rest. But the crowds are so eager, the crowds are so, um, you know, uh, longing to hear from him and to see more miracles that the crowd searches for them and comes over here to this place where they are trying to get some private time. And uh, we also notice in verse 4, it says, the Jewish Passover festival was near. So because the Passover festival was nearing, we, uh, there must be a lot of pilgrims as well who would have come. Uh, so this crowd is made up of the locals as well as uh, people from outside who are very curious to see this Jesus and uh, you know watch the miracles that he does. And so we have this large crowd searching him out and you know locating him over here near the mountainside uh, so um, jesus would have in fact preferred it if he could have spent some quiet time with his disciples you know going over all the uh, report of the mission trip you know encouraging them teaching them new things so that was lost they could not have that uh, quiet time together but it says uh, that you know uh, it says in um, in Luke, that he shows them great compassion, even though they have interrupted uh, what he had planned. Uh, he is kind to them and he ministers to them. So this is the background of uh, what follows. So uh, we in uh, Luke, we get to know that he spends a lot of time teaching them. Uh, the uh, Almost the entire day is spent in teaching them. And he also heals uh, the sick who have been brought. So all of this ministry goes on. And so it finally becomes very late uh, in the day. And uh, the crowd has no uh, you know, food uh, left uh, because whatever they have brought along with them has uh, run out. And so now at this point of time, uh, the current story begins. So we see uh, verse 5 onwards. Um, Jesus addressing the needs of the crowd. Uh, so uh, if we can have someone read out for us verses 5, 6, and 7, please. We are in John chapter 6. Uh, if we can have someone read out for us, verses 5, 6, and 7, please. John sub, chapter 6. Them. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, John chapter 6, verse 5 to 7. Then Jesus lift up, lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude comparing toward, uh, uh, coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that this may eat? But this is said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. Okay, so um, the details about the ministry that he does, the preaching that he does, the healing that happens, all of that is not mentioned here. Um, John just directly gets into the um, event which takes place immediately after the teaching and the healing. Uh, so uh, there's this large crowd which is waiting over there and they have no food. So now uh, he asks Philip. Philip and Andrew and Peter are all from this region. 
they're all from the you know Bethsaida region uh, so they would be familiar with places where you will you can buy bread and all of that but of course here in this situation where you have such a large crowd uh, even if they went to get the food supplies even if they had the money for that much of food supplies um, you know they probably would not uh, you know the people providing the food supplies probably would not have enough for such a large crowd so it says very clearly in verse 6 he asked this only to test him so jesus tests philip when he asks where shall we buy bread so uh, jesus wa waits to see how philip will respond now we have to keep in mind that these disciples have just come back victoriously from a mission trip uh, where even the demons had to you know flee when the name of jesus was taken up so they have seen the power of god at work god has used their hands their feet their mouths to deliver people to heal people they have come back from a highly successful mission trip and now jesus is bringing a test and uh, he says to philip uh, what do we do uh, where can we buy bread for these people and philip temporarily forgets all that has happened during the mission trip and he answers in the natural and he says i mean even if we had half a year's wages and we could purchase enough bread for all of them uh, um, uh, you know it, it would not be sufficient um, because uh, the number of people here are so large that even half a year's wages would actually not be sufficient so after this victorious mission trip this is philip's response and this can happen to us in our own christian walk you know there are times when we have uh, great victory uh, we have successfully fought the battle we have walked in faith uh, we have stood on what jesus said and we have claimed uh, the victory that is ours so uh, the lord is pleased with what we have done but now uh, we should not get inflated by that victory and forget the principles you know that we held on to during that time of uh, battle so immediately after the battle after a grand victory there is a chance there is a likelihood that we may um, forget the lessons that we have learned and revert back into our own natural uh, thinking which is what happened over here so if philip was still um, you know thinking along the lines that he had been during the mission trip he would have probably answered very differently he probably would have said um, um, let's look at uh, maybe another verse which can kind of throw light on this. Um, in uh, one of the other, in Luke chapter 9, you know, which we uh, referred to earlier, uh, we get to know a little bit about their mission trip. Uh, something that Jesus uh, tells them about how they should conduct that trip. Uh, so uh, if maybe we can have someone read out for us uh, Luke chapter 9, verses 3 to 5. Uh, Luke chapter 9, verses 3 to 5, please. Luke chapter 9, 3 to 6. And he said to them, Take nothing for the journey, neither staff. Yeah, um, if we can have someone else read out, because there seems to be some kind of uh, uh, feedback, audio feedback, uh, when uh, Brother Subhashish writes to read out. Uh, so if we can someone have someone else read out, Luke chapter 9, verses 3 to 5, please. Then he called his... 12 disciples to get and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither stuff, nor bags, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tonics apiece. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Here we see that um, Jesus specifically tells them when you go on your mission trip, 
do not take extra food with you do not take money with you you know do not take any kind of supplies with you because you have it's going to be a faith mission trip where you will be waiting upon the lord to provide uh, so they have actually done an exercise in faith when they went out on that mission trip there would have been homes that they would have gone to where people were not willing to receive them because that's what it says in the next two verses in luke chapter 9 uh, verses 4 and 5 it talks about how some people will not welcome them uh, and you know where, where when they would have to you know just leave that town and go away to the next town so they have been through those experiences and god has provided for them throughout all of that so um philip uh, maybe jesus was expecting um philip to answer differently you know philip the right answer which philip should have given uh, would have been uh, we saw what the lord has done during the mission trip we saw how god provided for all our needs and so now jesus even as this crowd is sitting over here i'm sure in the same way uh, god will provide for us now as well that probably would have been the response that jesus was expecting from philip but philip you know has forgotten uh, the all that has happened during the mission trip and the way god has provided and so now he just answers in the natural and he says even if he had half a year's wages that large amount would not be enough to even buy one bite for each person you know um, yeah in fact they, we would be able to buy only one bite for each person is what he says um then uh, we have another a little bit of dialogue happening in verses 8 to 11 if we can read out that as well please uh, uh, verses 8 to 11 Yeah, we are in John chapter six, verses eight to eleven. One of his disciples, Andrew Simon Peter's brother, said to him, "There is a lad here, uh, here who who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are are they among so many?" Then Jesus said, "Make the people sit down." Now there was much grass in the in the place so the men sat down in number about 5000 and Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks he he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted yes thanks a lot uh, selectively for reading out for us uh, it helps a lot um yeah so here we see in these verses uh, that one boy who is there in the group is willing to offer whatever he has uh, to help out with a food need uh, so he comes forward and uh, he says that he has five barley loaves and two fish with him which he is willing to share uh, but then of course you know the crowd is so large that even half a year's wages would not be enough to feed them and so this uh, is rather a small amount so andrew you know uh, says how far will they go among so many and just to, you know to note down here uh, these are barley loaves which this boy has with him uh, barley was something eaten by the people who are not very well off um, uh, you know it was not a very tasty grain uh, for them at that time at that point of time so um, this boy is obviously not from a very wealthy background he probably belongs to the poorer uh, class and yet whatever little he has he is willing to share that with others and that is a good attitude to have because jesus takes that so you know nobody else comes forward and offers anything this is the only offer and jesus takes that he takes it and he says fine you know let, let everyone sit down and then it says in verse 11 Jesus then took those loaves you know those barley loaves which are not exactly um, what what uh, luxurious food he takes it he gives thanks and he begins to distribute those 
five loaves and those two fish to the entire crowd. And as, he, as it is being distributed by the disciples, it just keeps multiplying. It doesn't run out. Um, so what do we learn from this? We see a few things here. The attitude of this uh, boy, he was not very well to do. He didn't really have anything fancy to offer. But whatever little he had, he was willing to give it. And then what does Jesus do with that? Uh, the Lord takes that, gives thanks for it, and distributes it. So we may not have much, but whatever we do have, if we are willingly uh, ready to offer that to the Lord, uh, you know, with thanksgiving, you know, uh, Jesus does that. Here we see Jesus acting out an act of faith. All he has in his hands are five loaves and two fish, but he gives thanks to that confidently, believing that God the Father will do whatever is required with that, what with whatever is available at hand, and he will, you know, satisfy the crowd. So Jesus believes that. And so with that faith, Jesus says, thank you to the Lord and starts distributing it. So that can be our own attitude. You know, uh, if we are involved in ministry, maybe we are not the people with the greatest talents or the greatest skills. Maybe we don't have um, as much finances as the other organizations and ministries. Or, you know, we may just be someone who is in the secular field. You know, you know, we work at an office or we work at a school, uh, wherever we are serving, we may feel that we are not really the best equipped people. But God always works with whatever is at hand. So if you are the only believer over there in that particular place where, you know, God has placed you, then you are what is at hand. And God will use what is at hand if it is offered to him willingly. So whatever you have, whatever skills you have, you take that and you say, Lord, right now, this is what is available. I'm all there is over here. I'm the only believer in this place. And these are my talents. Not very great, but whatever I have, I'm willing to use it. And if we thankfully offer it to the Lord, trusting him to use it, he will use you to be a blessing in that place. It will not matter how um, you know limited those skills are. You may not be the next Billy Graham, but that will not matter because you see God takes whatever is at hand, that whatever has been willingly offered to him, that he takes it and he multiplies it and makes sure that that will meet the needs of the people that God is sending to you. So yours may be a small ministry. Maybe your finances are limited. Maybe your skills are limited. But the people who are being sent to you by God, they will receive what they need. Whatever you have in your hands will be sufficient to meet their requirements. Uh, so we never have to doubt that uh, you know God can take what we are offering and um, make it serve his purposes. So. He is a God of miracles. So um, here we see that um, God has deliberately placed you in a certain situation with certain skills. And though in the eyes of the world, you may not really have uh, uh, sufficient uh, resources, God will take that little because you are acting in faith and you're acting with gratitude that whatever you have is adequate for the situation. You know, you're grateful and you really believe that. And with that attitude, God can use you. you know, so uh, whatever the Lord does, he does it in our lives deliberately. It's not that just accidentally you ended up with the, with the skills that you have. No. The skill set which you possess has been deliberately given to you by the Lord. And the setting in which he has placed you you know, in a place maybe you're where you don't really have the support of other believers. Maybe, we, you know, a place where um, you don't really have uh, open doors which are wide open for you to minister and help people and serve people. God has deliberately placed you in those situations with those particular limited skills because he knows that it will give you a chance to act in greater faith. 
you know like jesus you can uh, take that bold step and say thank you lord i know that what i'm holding in my hands is sufficient i will be able to fulfill your purposes in this place and you know when we have we step out in faith in that way that little that we have will prove sufficient is you know that's the lesson that comes across over here uh, through this passage uh, there's more to this lesson which we see in the uh, next two verses uh, so yes if we can have someone read out for us uh, verses 12 and 13 please verses 12 and 13 so when they were filled yeah, please go I'm really grateful to the two of you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Brother Subhashish, uh, audio seems to be clear right now. Uh, there's no audio feedback. So yes, brother, you can go ahead. Yeah. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of five barley loaves which are left over by those who had eaten. Yeah. Uh, so we see another lesson coming through here. Uh, Jesus says, you know, um, we placed the bread in front of all the small groups which were sitting there to eat. Uh, so, you know, they would have placed a certain amount of uh, uh, bread and a certain amount of fish in front of each group. So they have all eaten. All the groups have eaten to their heart's content. And now you still have a lot of bread and fish left over. Why? Where was the need for this surplus? I mean, God is um, perfect at calculations. He knows exactly how many people there are. He knows exactly how, e uh, how much each of them is going to consume. So maybe he could have produced the exact amount, required amount. But here we see that God arranges for a surplus of 12 baskets. See, they're able to get uh, whatever is left over is is filling up 12 baskets why the great surplus i think it is just god showing that when he wishes to provide this is how he provides he is generous there are no limits to what he can do so when you are in that you know um ministry situation you know where you are working in some uh, place which is very difficult to access the people there are not responding very well to the gospel and you uh, you don't have much finances uh, to be able to you know take up uh, maybe large projects and things like that even if you're in that place and you just like jesus you take what little you have and you say thank you lord and you begin to use that in that place God can do such a great work that not only are the needs of that particular group met, but there would be a surplus left over. That is the, uh, you know, the lesson that God is trying to bring out. Because you, if, you, if you remember, everything that Jesus is doing, he's doing it as a sign to show who he is, what kind of a father he represents, what he uh, wishes to do for people. These are all signs indicating a lesson indicating something very clearly and so these signs can um, you know are signs even for us the readers today so we can learn from these things and we can confidently uh, you know minister wherever we are you may just be a school teacher you know working in some in, in some secular school but whatever you have in your hands it will be sufficient for you to minister to those children, you know, academically minister to them academically, also uh, give them a word of encouragement about what Christ can do in their lives, you will be able to meet the needs of those children. And moreover, there would be a surplus beyond what you expected. So those are the lessons which come across, uh, you know, um, through this um, event. The next recorded event is the um, people's response to what has happened. The people are, are amazed that five loaves led to a leftover surplus of 12 baskets. Now, that really is quite a miracle. So now what happens? We see the response of the people. Um, if we could have um, someone read out for us, verses 14 and 15. Yeah, 14, 15. 
then those men when they had seen the sign that jesus did said this is truly the prophet who is come into the world therefore when jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king he departed again to the mountain by himself alone yeah so the response of the people is that here we have someone who can supply bread in this manner uh, and so it reminds them of moses who also supplied them with manna and uh, so and moreover moses had said uh, in deuteronomy 18 verses 15 to 18 that one day god would raise up another prophet like me and so they make the connection and they tell themselves oh this uh, this is like another moses this is like the other prophet which moses had told us about so uh, you know let us make him our king because then he can supply us with all our material needs and when jesus sees that they are almost ready to forcibly make him king he withdraws uh, to the uh, you know into the mountain by himself because that is not his mission that is not why he came there will be a time when he will come as king and he will sit on the throne but right now he has come as the lamb of god that is his current mission and so um, you know jesus withdraws from them um, after this we um, come to an other event uh, so now it's quite late in the evening and uh, now the disciples decide to take a boat and cross over to the other side uh, and um, jesus does not join them in the boat he says that he will come later and uh, so we see that event being described over here so maybe we can uh, read out verses 16 up to verse 21 please uh, all the way from 16 up to verse 21 Now when evening came his disciples went down to the sea got into the boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum and it was already dark and Jesus had not come to them then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing so when they had rowed about 3 and 4 miles they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat and they were afraid but he said to them it is i do not be afraid then they willing willingly received him into the boat and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going yeah now um something about the geographical location of this lake caused all these storms on this lake uh, so um i mean this was explained in some great detail in some background commentary you know but how you would have winds coming from two different directions and so when um, it it used to create some kind of a don't remember whether it was a high pressure uh, area or a low pressure area something something to do the winds and i'm very very bad at geography uh, but anyway so it it would it would lead to constant uh, um, storms unexpectedly on this lake Uh, so this was something that used to occur quite frequently and it uh, it said in the commentary that these uh, storms could be so violent that you know if the boat was a smaller boat it could even get overturned so this was a serious matter so in the middle of this storm we have jesus approaching them um on the waters and obviously because people generally do not walk on water the disciples assume that it is some kind of a spirit or some kind of a ghost and they are rather afraid but then Jesus assures them it is me so you don't need to be afraid then they bring him into the boat and then we see it says immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading uh on other occasions in the other gospels we see that Jesus speaks to the storm and the storm stills here he does not speak to the storm the storm continues but they just are teleported right from the middle of the lake to their destination in a matter of seconds so i mean all i i mean you know all this incident all these events which are recorded over here in the gospels each of them is trying to teach us something so the point that is being made over here is that for us what looks like an impossibility 
what looks like a you know a life ending storm from god's perspective he's got multiple options on how to handle it all is looking for from our side is faith so for us looking at it from our uh, from our end we would think my goodness we are in deep trouble i mean uh, this is an impossible situation and we are in a small boat no way can we survive is what maybe we would think but then god who is sitting on his throne he looks at the storm he looks at the small boat he looks at the helps helpless people and he's got multiple options on how to handle the situation all he's waiting for is that uh, response of faith if we stand in faith then he will choose how to handle the situation he may speak to the storm and ask it to be still or he may just simply take you to the destination where you're meant to go safely you know we are with with the storm still raging so god can work in multiple ways all that's actually required from us is faith that he will um come through for us that when we cry out to him he will hear and answer us uh, so the next day uh, uh they are now on the opposite side of the lake and the crowd comes comes back once again and here we just have one comment being made um you know that is in uh, verse verses 26 and 27 and uh, this leads to a long conversation about jesus you know saying i am the bread of life and all of that uh, so in verses 26 if, if if we could have someone read out just verses 26 and 27 please Jesus answered them and said most most assuredly i said to you you seek me not because you saw the signs but because you ate the loaves and were filled do not labor for the food which perishes but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the son of man will give you because god the father has set his seal on him yeah so the reason the crowd comes back now is because of the sign which they saw a little earlier where they saw the food being multiplied miraculously so now jesus says to them you know um, don't come to me just for material things you know there are bigger things at stake so which is what he says over here in verse 27 do not work for food that spoils but for food that endures to eternal life in other words jesus you know seems to be indicating the words i speak the message which i am teaching about the kingdom that is more important than the physical food which i can provide so if you're pursuing that if you're pursuing eternal life then that can actually last you for eternity on the other hand if all you have on your mind is you know getting um, physical food out of me that food will get you know gets gets spoiled after a while so um, that's just something temporary so here jesus tells them you need to pursue eternal things i'm very sorry you need to pursue eternal things is what the lord says here um and then uh, so then uh, when jesus says this to them their question is this uh, if we can have someone read out verses 28 and 29 yeah then they said to him what shall we do that we may work the works of god and jesus answered and said to them this is the work of god that you believe in him whom he sent exactly so here uh, so they say okay fine you're telling us to pursue eternal things uh, so okay fine what should we do then or what must we do to do the works god requires and jesus says the first thing that you're supposed to do is believe in me you know whom uh, god has sent so the very first work of god is not you know immediately going out into the nearest town and uh, start preaching the gospel uh, the first work that is expected of us is not to go and perform miracles the very first work is believing in him placing our trust and faith in him that is the starting point everything else follows 
uh, flows out of that faith. So the very first step that God requires of us, the greatest work that God requires of us is not so much our ministry, but our faith. Faith in doing uh, the things that he has called us to do. Faith also in the sense of obedience, where we willingly just submit to whatever he's asking of us. So when you have that kind of a obedience and that kind of a submission and that kind of a trust in him, ministry automatically follows. I mean, God will bring to us the people whom he wants us to minister to, and they will get ministered to. Whatever we have in our hands will be sufficient. First step, the very first work of God which he wants is not really a work. It's not really an, uh, an action. It is rather trust. So once we have that attitude of complete obedience and trust and submission, everything else just flows out of that. So this is one very valuable learning that actually comes through to us you know, from uh, this passage. Uh, and then Jesus goes on to say in uh, verses 32 and 33, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if if we can just read out verses 32 and 33, please. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So um, Jesus, you know, says, I mean, you, you are comparing me with Moses. You are saying that mana, um, Moses provided mana. And in the same way, you want me to provide you with uh, bread. But uh, he points out, Moses did not really give you bread from heaven. Yes, it's true that the mana fell down from the skies. But this was not heavenly bread in the sense. It was something which got spoiled after a while. It could only... Um, provide and sustain temporarily. And moreover, the people who ate this mana, they went on to die a physical death you know, at the end of their lives. Uh, so on the other hand, the bread which I have come to give, that is going to be uh, eternal because that will not perish. That will give you an eternal life that will uh, take you uh, into you know, eternity uh, to be with God always. So he says, um, that is why Jesus says in verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. This is not temporary bread. This is not like that mana which could, you know, get spoiled after a while. This is Jesus, he says, I am the bread of life. That is why if anyone comes to me, he says, they will never go hungry. Uh, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty because he will be there to take care of every spiritual need that they have. And once your spiritual needs are met and you are standing strong in the Lord, the material needs, I mean, they get fulfilled automatically. Because you know, that's what Jesus says, right? In um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And as long as your focus is on that, all these things will be added unto you. I mean, it will automatically be added unto you. So that is why he says, whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty because, you know, you have placed your spiritual needs first and you are coming to me to have those fulfilled. And once you are strong in me, the rest of the things will be added unto you anyway, you know, because the Heavenly Father knows what you require. Um, so, so these are the uh, learnings that Jesus brings across. And then he goes on to make some important points um, uh, regarding... Uh, in what sense he is the bread of life and what should be their approach to this bread of life. Uh, so if we can have someone read out for us, uh, verses 53 to 57. Yeah, 53 to 57. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I 
in him as the living father sent me and i live because of the father so he who feeds on me will live because of me yeah yeah so um, um now there are people in the crowd who probably understand what jesus is saying and then there are those who misunderstand uh, we have in uh, verse 52 you know uh, some of the jews they say how can this man give us his flesh to eat so they are taking the words literally as though you know jesus is saying that they should feed on his uh, physical flesh so yes there are some who misunderstand but then there are others who actually understand what he is saying because he was using wording which would have been familiar to them you know the metaphor there's a metaphor in their hebrew language which talks about um, eating and drinking and over there uh, it's not referring to someone consuming human flesh it's saying whatever i'm speaking to you you know um, absorb it into your innermost being so in that sense you're literally eating and drinking what the rabbi is teaching so if you know if you have a rabbi who is you know um uh, sharing god's word and explaining the truths to you you literally eat and you drink what is being offered to you you uh, when we eat and drink what happens um the food and the water it literally gets inside us it gets absorbed into our very core every single cell of the human body absorbs that water you know um, draws the nutrients out of that food it becomes a part of us right so in that sense um uh, you know when 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 a, when a rabbi would come and teach the word of god the audience was expected to literally eat and drink of it where uh, whatever has been taught literally becomes a part of them becomes a, a a a part of their very inner core now here jesus is saying i am literally the teaching the word that you need you literally eat me and you drink me in the sense you know all that i am saying to you believe it and not just believe in my words but believe in me that i am from the father that i am divine that i am the messiah who has been sent from heaven to you so accept that to an extent you know where in your actions in your choices you start uh, showing that you believe in me and have submitted to me because when you do that uh, you are literally absorbing me into your into the very core of your being so uh, there are some who misunderstand and they say oh this man is saying that we have to eat his flesh so there are some who do misunderstand what jesus says but then there are others who have caught what he is saying and they are not very happy with what he is saying this is their response to uh, to hear to his words um yeah he uh, if if we can have someone read out for us verses 41 and 42 which points out how they feel about what jesus said 41 42 the jews then complained about him because he said i am the bread i am the bread which came down from heaven and they said is not this jesus the son of joseph whose father and mother we know how is it then that he says i have come down from heaven yeah so we'll reflect on this uh, a little further after uh, you know we come back from the break uh, so um, if we can have everyone log in once again um 10 minutes later thank you so much